Excuse me. I have a UNICEW card here for Patricia Marianne. Is she from this class? No? OK. Um, we have a number of case studies which are still remaining, so let's proceed. I'll go a bit quicker now that we have an idea of how dynamic programming works. Uh, at any point, if you still feel that some clarification is required, please feel free to interrupt me. All right? Yeah. Could you give us a concrete example of the We will find some concrete examples. But the best way to view it is visualize a table, and you're filling up a table. I think we'll encounter a couple of concrete examples. Yeah. So, the next problem is going to be a very classic problem called uh, integer knapsack, where you allow for duplicate items. And the problem is that you have a set of n items. Each item of i, a kind i, are identical. And each item of type i has weight wi and a value which is vi. So you have all these items of all these types, and you have a knapsack which is of capacity capital C. You want to find, you want to put as many items in your knapsack as the capacity allows. So the sum of the weights of the items has to be at most capital C. While imposing this condition, you want to maximize the value of the items you have put in the knapsack. So this is the question, uh, this is the problem. You want to find an optimal knapsack or a combination of available items which fit the knapsack and whose value is the largest. And you can take any number of items of each kind. So it's just like in the coin example, each, so just as each coin denomination had as many coins as you needed, again, for each type i, you can use as many of those item types. So, Again, uh, the solution is via dynamic programming, and the recursion is on capital C. We are again going to build a table which is of length, which is the same as the length, uh, the value capital C. And the way to visualize it concretely is that you fill up a value for entry one, then two, then three, and so on, until you have filled up all the entries. And hopefully, by looking at those entries, we will have our desired solution, which is the optimal knapsack. So again, we want to use the solutions of the sub-problems to solve the larger problem. So suppose we have already solved the problem for all knapsacks of capacity j less than i. So we are gradually solving the knapsack problem for larger i's, where i is some value which is an integer less than capital C which is also an integer. And we, in order to solve the knapsack for value i, we look at all the optimal solutions, opt i minus wm for all knapsacks of capacity, which is i minus wm for all m from 1 till n. OK, so it's assuming that you want to find the optimal solution for value i, and assuming that you had one item of type m in the solution, if you have that item in the solution, and if you remove that, then the remaining items optimally solve the knapsack problem for value i minus wm. So again, we, in order to solve this problem for pi, we solve the problem for pi minus wm, and we go over all possible m's from 1 to n, because we, we are not sure which m is in the solution, so we just exhaustively do it. It's just a linear number of uh, item types. It's part of the input. And by looking at all those, we can find the optimal solution. So we simply choose that particular m for which opt i minus wm is largest, and we can then simply add this value into this, and we know that uh, it will not exceed the capacity, which is i. So by doing this for each capacity i, which is some value less than or equal to c, 
you can just look at all uh, m's which are less than, uh, which are between 1 to n you can use that to find the value for uh, this table entry uh, i so by doing that you can solve this table and find all the values and after you have done that for all values here you see that essentially uh, the the value which you have for the last entry in the table which is capital c is the optimal solution because that is a solution where the capacity is the largest and you will you're going to get the largest possible value for that capacity so again we're using dynamic programming to look at sub problems we solve those problems to find a larger solution problem and by continuing like this uh, we find the solution of um, the knapsack problem when you have capacity capital C. So again, it's not super concrete, but the best way to visualize it is in terms of a table. And we are gradually filling that table by first looking at the first entry, then second entry, and so on, until we fill up the C, capital C entry. And in order to solve um, for any of those entries, we simply need to look at the entries for which are left of that particular table entry, and that's it. And in, in order to look at those table entries, we also additionally look at all these values from m, which is from 1 to n. So it's again uh, an algorithm which requires looking at entries which is equal to the number of, which is the size of capital C, and possibly having a linear uh, add up. So n times C is again the running time of this algorithm. All right? So it's very similar in nature to this example we had for coin exchange, where we're finding, optimizing the minimum number of coins uh, to get a target value. Here we are optimizing by, we have a given capacity and we're trying to maximize the value given that capacity. So just to make things a bit more concrete, I was just giving you some intuition. For any value i, in order to find the optimal value for a target capacity i is simply looking at all m from 1 to n and finding opt of i minus wm. So this is the optimal value when you have this capacity. You find this optimal value and then add this particular value vm uh, to that particular uh, solution and this is going to be solution for a, one particular m, you find the maximum one, and then this is going to give you the optimal solution for value i. Using that, you can find the optimal solution for capital C, and this corresponds to the optimal solution, which is global. So after c many steps, we again find an op c, which is what we need, and we are done. So again, as mentioned earlier, uh, capital C may not be polynomial in n, so in that sense, this algorithm is not polynomial, it's pseudo-polynomial. But as, as long as C is not too large, the table is not going to be too large, and we can simply fill up that table to find uh, the desired solution. So we look at another integer knapsack problem. And in this particular integer knapsack problem, uh, you have a slightly different condition. And that condition is that you do not have an unlimited number of uh, items of each type. So now you just think of n items, some of which may be identical, some of which may not be identical. Each item, capital I i, is of weight w i and of value v i. So again, it's, the input is very similar. Uh, and we want to have, we have a capacity capital C. And we want to choose a set of available items which all fit the knapsack so that they're weight does not exceed capital C, and the value is as large as possible. So this is going to be a bit more concrete because uh, there's a diagram involved here as well. So, and this is what is an example of a 2D uh, uh, recursion. So we'll be filling up a table of size n times c. In the previous two examples, we were just filling a table which had n different entries. Now we have, we're going to fill a table which has n times capital C entries. It's a two-dimensional table um, where the problem which we're going to solve is called PIC, 
where i ranges from all from 1 to n and small c ranges from 1 till capital C. So what exactly is this sub problem? So we are really restricting a sub problem in a nice way so in order to get more structure. And the sub problem we want to solve is P I C. So why, what is the I? So I means that we just restrict our attention to the first I items. Secondly, we want to choose items from this set of items which fits in a knapsack of capacity C and is of largest possible value. So just by, let's say we've solved all problems of P, I, C. Do we, is this enough to find the global value? I see some nods. Uh, does anybody want to respond? Why, why that's the case? So let's suppose we already have solved P, I, C for all I's and all C's. So how does having all this information help in finding our global solution? Yeah? Yeah, uh, you could just look at you could just look at all the entries in the table and find that. Uh, but there's actually a, a better way. You just need to you know which table entry to look at to find the solution. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So both answers are correct. Uh, you could just look at all. Uh, the table entries, they're all possible sets where you, which are ex not exceeding the capacity capital C. But an even quicker answer is set C to capital C, set I to small n, and look at that entry in the table, and that's the uh, optimal value of the solution. Why is that? Because when C is capital C, that means that you are using the full capacity of the knapsack. And when i is small n, then you are essentially using all the items which are available. So that is going to give you the best solution. So this is what we're going to do. We, we look at all i less than n, all c uh, less than capital C, and we solve smaller subproblems. So we solve subproblem for all j less than i, and for all knapsack capacities from 1 to capital C. And we also solve it for, for the same value of i, but for all capacities, small d less than c. So we are gradually going to solve all these smaller subproblems. And the best way to think about it is in terms of this table. So you don't have a super concrete example, so this is just a way to visualize it again. So, so this entry corresponds to the case where you just have one, the first item, and you just have capacity one. And this particular entry is the one which I mentioned as a question I had earlier, that this corresponds to the optimal value of the solution uh, of a global problem. So what do we do? And let's say we, we just gradually uh, fill up this table. So let's say we want to fill up this particular entry in the table. In order to fill up this entry, which corresponds to i and small c, we, need, we assume that we have already solved it for all j less than i, so all these rows. And we've also solved it for the same i, but all d less than c. Given that, I'm claiming that this is all we need to find this entry. And why is that? Well, the answer is that we just need to look at the optimal solutions of opt i minus 1, c minus wi, and opt i minus 1 and c. The issue is that we are deciding whether we want to put uh, item i in the knapsack or not. So we just need to look at two possible entries. One is when uh, you go, instead of i, you look at i minus 1. Another is when you look at c minus wi. So this particular 
entry corresponds to the fact that you did not include i. If you did not include i, then simply the value is going to be of the optimal solution when you do not include i. If you do include i, that means that the capacity reduces by this much, which is c minus wi, and this you are already assuming has been solved optimally. So we just need to look at two different entries in the table. And if let's say this entry opt i minus 1, comma c minus wi plus vi, because when we include item i, we get an additional value. If this is greater than opt i minus i, comma c, we just pick that item i. Otherwise, and we put this, we increase the value like this, opt i, comma c is equal to the previous value plus vi, because we have now additionally included item i. If we do not additionally include item i, then it's simply the optimal solution of opt i minus 1, comma c. So in order to fill the table, any entry in the table, we just need to look at two other entries, which are one is just above and another is uh, somewhere above and on the left. And by looking at these entries, uh, we can find the optimal one and we can fill the table. So again, this table can be filled. The size of the table is n times c. This table can be filled, and this is going to be the final solution uh, of the problem. So there's a related problem which uh, is also very important in computer science. It's called balance partition or partitioning problem. And the idea is that you have set of integers, n integers, and you want to partition them in as balanced a way as possible. The idea is that if you were to partition the integers into two sets, S1 and S2, uh, no, sorry, into two sets where the, the sum of the values of one set is S1, the other value is S2, then the difference between these two sums is as less as possible. So this is a very classic uh, computer science problem. And what I'm going to argue for is that actually the problem that we solved in the previous slide, the optimal knapsack problem, already helps to solve this particular problem. So we're going to go over this very quickly. Um, again, the input is set of integers. We look at the knapsack. And let's say the sum of uh, the integers is capital S. So we think in terms of a knapsack problem where the capacity the capacity of the knapsack is s divided by 2. And each integer xi of both size value is equal to xi. So it's a simpler version of this problem we had in the previous slide. And what I'm claiming is that we can solve this problem by simply solving this knapsack problem where you have these uh, capital C is s over 2, and the values and the Weights are simply xi's. And why is that? Just, you can just do a bit of arithmetic. And the main thing is that when s is equal to s1 plus s2, that we know because the sum of integers is capital S, the sum of integers of one set is s1, the other set is s2, then s over 2 minus s1 is simply equal to s1 plus s2 over 2 minus s1. This is simply because if you just Simplify it, you'll see both of them are sim uh, exactly the, the same. And this is equal to S2 minus S1. So this means that S2 minus S1 is simply equal to 2 times S over 2 minus S1. And just this, all this arithmetic is simply being done to show that minimizing S over 2 minus S1 is the same as minimizing S2 minus S1. So, for the balance partitioning problem, we are minimizing S2 minus S1. And for knapsack, recall that if this is the target capacity and we are going as close as possible, that means we are, uh, we are keeping within that capacity but increasing our value as much as possible. So both these problems are essentially the same. So the problem in the previous slide, which was for knapsack, can help to solve this particular problem. So, how many of you have done computational complexity, uh, course in computational complexity, or using reductions from one problem to the other? OK, so 
this is also an example of reducing one problem to the other. So you do not have to find a different algorithm for each problem. Sometimes it's a case that one problem is so related to another that in, in, instead of finding a solution for each problem separately, you can simply change one problem into another problem and find the solution of the problem you've reduced to to find the uh, solution for the original problem. So in this case, what we've actually done is we have taken a problem and we've just <coughs> modified it or seen it in a different way in terms of a knapsack problem. And we already know, know how to solve the knapsack problem, which was the problem in the previous slide. This just a side, side comment. It's not central to our discussion on dynamic programming. But sometimes you, you just need to see some connections. You do not have to find a new algorithm for each problem. It may be the case that you can simply modify your problem slightly to a problem which you're already comfortable with, and then solve that problem with an algorithm which you already know, and use that solution to find the problem so solution of your new problem. So in particular, this knapsack dynamic program, which was in the previous slide, can be reused in many different ways. So it may be the case that you come up with a new problem. It's very related to dynamic programming for knapsack. And instead of finding a new dynamic program for that problem, you can simply convert your problem into a corresponding knapsack problem. So Again, all we have to do is find the subset of numbers with the largest possible total sum, which is exactly the knapsack problem on the previous slide. OK, so let's move on to a, a bit more interesting uh, type of problem, where you may not just be doing one kind of uh, uh, sub-problems. You may have multiple types of sub-problems. For now, we've just been filling up one particular table. Either it was uh, one row of a table, or it was a a table of size n times c. Here we're going to solve two different tables in tandem. So this is a problem which comes up in assembly line scheduling. So it's a problem where you have n different jobs which you have to do. Uh, say you're uh, assembling, making some product, an iPhone, which has to have different things done on uh, two possible lines. So there's line one, which is this one, and line two, which is this one. And you have a choice. So you could do a certain job on the phone on a workstation, which is uh, in line one, or you could do the same job on a workstation on line two. It's up to you. But the time taken for each of those in different workstations might be different. So after you've done a job here, you, this next job, you might say, I want to do it here, because uh, it will take less time on the other line. But when you do that, there may be some charge for transferring that item from this to the other line. So there are all these different information which are relevant. So let's just go over these pieces of information. So we say that there are two lines, assembly lines, and the kth job takes time a sub i 1 comma k, units of time, for k between 1 to n. And on the second assembly line, it takes time a 2 comma k. All right? So same job could take different uh, time on assembly line one or two. To move a product from station k minus one on the first assembly line to station k on the second line takes time t one comma k minus one. Similarly, if you want to move a product from station k minus one on the second assembly line to station k on the first assembly line, it takes time t one comma k minus one. I believe this should be t. 2k minus 1, all right? Because we're moving from 2 to 1, and here it's moving from 1 to. If, if both of them take the same time, then you can say it's, it's the same. But in general, it could be different. So initially, there's an initial cost as well. You need to take it to assembly line. So that takes C1 here and C2 here. Sorry, it's E1 and E2. And what else do we have? Uh, we also have information about. After you've done from the assembly line, you need to take it to the warehouse. So there's an additional time of x1 if you're on assembly line 1, and you have additional time of x2 if you're on assembly line 2. So is the problem clear? There's, yeah? Well, 
So, so there's just think of it as there's only one product. There's only one product uh, right now, and you want to find the optimal way to uh, assemble the problem, uh, the product. Uh, the product has to take uh, undergo n different tasks, but that task could either be done on assembly line one or assembly line two. So the only reason you might want to take it from assembly line one to assembly line two could be because for the next task, uh, the other assembly line may do it faster. Okay, so you're, you're doing something along an assembly line, one task after another, and maybe you take it to the other assembly line. You do some tasks, maybe you take it back to the next assembly line. So they always end tasks which are done in the same order, but at some point you may uh, do the same task on a different assembly line. So you're just trying to minimize time from that one product, not, not the overall efficiency usage of the line? Yeah. So there may be much more complex problems involving many different items. This is one problem we're just concerned with one particular uh, assembly of a product. Okay. Is the problem clear? Because if the problem is not clear, uh, dynamic programming would be much more complicated. Okay, so this is the problem which we are uh, encountering. We want to find the fastest way to assemble a product using both lines as necessary. So this may apply to multiple products as well, because you may, may use the same, uh, all the items are following the same path, right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to solve two different types of sub-problems. One is problem P1, k, another is problem P2, k, by a simultaneous recursion on k. So note that this is the first time we're doing the simultaneous uh, recursion. So say P1 comma K is one of the sub-problems we have set up, just like in the previous problems. And how do we define P1 comma K? So P1 comma K is the minimal amount of time M1 comma K needed to finish the first K job such that the Kth job is finished on the first assembly line. So note here that even in one of the first problems, we, we enforce this condition that, uh, that for the sub-problem, we enforce that the item is scheduled, uh, AI is scheduled at, at this time. Again, we are doing something similar because this really helps us in solving the next larger problem. So this is P1 comma K. P2 comma K is defined in exactly the same way in a symmetric manner. Only difference in the definition is that we are focusing on the fact that the item is finishing, the kth item is finishing on the second assembly line. So that's the only difference. So these are the two sub-problems which we want to solve in tandem. So we first want to solve them for P1, 1, then P1, 2, 1. Using that, we want to solve larger problems. So you can think of it as filling out two different arrays at the same time in tandem. So let's do that. So for in order to solve P1, 1 and P2, 1 is very simple. Uh, we initially have the minimum time is simply for the first task is E1 plus A11 if you schedule the first task, uh, the item onto the first assembly line. And this is the amount of time which if you do the first task on the second assembly line. So you, all you need to do is you need to compare them and find the one which is better. So this is the way you can solve it for uh, P1, 1 and P2, uh, and P2, 1. Suppose that we have solved all these sub-problems uh, by, by going in tandem and we now want to solve problem M1, k and problem uh, m2 comma k so note that m small m is simply denoting the optimal value for the solution of the problem related to 1 comma k and 2 comma k so recall what was p1 comma k it was the fact that the kth task is scheduled on the first assembly line so this means that there are two ways uh, this could be done one is that 
you schedule, you always have to schedule the, uh, the task on the first assembly line because you're, you have this parameter one. So this is the additional time taken for the kth task on the first assembly line. But there are two ways you could do it. Either it's the case that the last job was on the same assembly line. In that case, this is the optimal solution. Or it's the case that the last job was done on the second assembly line. In that case, you not only find the optimal solution m2, 2 comma k minus 1, but then you also have this additional time required to transfer that particular task to, to go back to the first assembly line. So these are the only two options you have. And as long as you have solved both these options optimally for the smaller subproblems, you are done. So again, uh, you may want to solve this same problem for m2 comma k, and it's done exactly in the same way. You are finding the optimal solution where you are enforcing the condition that the kth job is scheduled on the second assembly line. And there are two options. Either the previous job was done on the same assembly line, or the previous job was done on the first assembly line. You find the optimal solutions for either of the two, both of them, and then you find the minimum of that. So you always take into account that maybe it's better to change, uh, maybe it's better to go to the other assembly line. If even if you add this additional uh, time for transfer, even then it might be quicker. So by considering both these options exhaustively, and by knowing that you've optimally solved all problems which are smaller, you can increasingly solve larger problems. Is that clear? So um, you keep on s filling up these tables uh, in tandem. Eventually, you have solved m1, n, and m2, n. And after you have done that, you just need to take them to the workstation. So you just add this x1 and x2. And you just find the one which gives you the optimal. And you're done. OK. Um, any questions regarding the previous uh, problem? Because it's one of the interesting uh, dynamic programs where you're doing things in tandem. OK. Another problem which we encounter is uh, matrix multiplication. Um, so the idea of matrix multiplication is uh, how, how many of you, when was the last time you guys did matrix multiplication? Recently? OK, that's good. So um, even if you don't, basically, there's some things are, that you need to be familiar with. So the idea is that if you have several matrix uh, matrices and you want to multiply them, the order in which you multiply them can make a big difference in how many uh, actual number multi multiplications are required. So let's say you have three different matrices. A, B, and C, and assume that they have the sizes of these matrices are compatible, which means that if A is being multiplied with B, note that the number of columns here is the same as the number of rows here. The number of columns of B is the same as number of rows of C, and that is the requirement for you to be able to do valid multiplication of matrices. So there are two ways you can multiply these matrices. One is A times B, and then you do multiply that with C, or you could do B times C, and then you multiply it with A. But doing it differently can have a big impact. So when you do it, first you multiply A and B. Uh, you basically are dealing with small matrices. But if you multiply A by first multiplying B and C, then you may have to do much more multiplication. So here's an actual track of how much multiplication you're required to do. Uh, it's the number of multiplications is simply when you do A times B is um, 10 into 5 into 100. And then again, you, do, you get this matrix and you do it again. So you get 7,500 multiplications when you do A times B and then C. On the other hand, if you do B times C first and then you multiply it with A, you need to do way more multiplications. So the answer is going to be the same, but you want to do it in an optimal manner. So the problem here is, is that we want to find the right 
way of bracketing the um, matrices so that the number of actual real number multiplications is minimized. So this is the problem which we're going to deal with and we're going to solve it again by dynamic programming. So we have a problem instance where you have uh, these uh, matrices fr denoted from A1 to An and we want to group them in a way so that we want to minimize the total number of real number multiplications. So the total number of different distributions of brackets is equal to the binary tree with n different leaves and that's why I don't want to go into too much detail but the main thing is that if you just enumerate all different brackets it's going to be too many to do it in an efficient manner. So you want to do it in an efficient manner and that is why we're going to use dynamic programming. So again uh, as many problems which can be solved by dynamic programming it if you do it in a naive way or just using recursion, you may have to solve too many subproblems, which you do not want to do. So we have to set up the subproblem in an appropriate manner so that we can we just need to focus on a polynomial number of subproblems. So what is the subproblem that we're going to look at? So the problem we're going to look at is called pi comma j. And what does this problem require? So this problem just focuses on a certain range of matrices from A1, AI to AJ. And we want to minimize the total number of multiplications needed to, to find the product matrix. So first question is, if we solve all these kind of subproblems, have we solved our global problem? Sorry? B1 to n. Exactly. So B1 to n means that you have included all the matrices in your uh, optimization and you have dealt with all of them and you've dealt with them in an optimal manner. So it's simply you're, you're doing it for different ranges and you solve them for different ranges by first looking at smaller ranges, then slightly larger ranges, and so on. So the argument is going to be that you just need to restrict yourself to smaller ranges first, solve all of them, use those optimal solutions to find optimal solutions for larger ranges. So it may look like a 2D recursion again, but in fact it can be done by a table which is just a row. So what we do is we group sub such problems by the value j minus i and perform a recursion on the value of j minus i which means that first we're going to solve all those problems which have j minus i which is very small. Uh, it could be f any compatible j, j and i's from 1 to n, but we just solve them for small j minus i's, then slightly larger, and eventually we will solve it for the greatest range which is going to be uh, 1 comma n. So at each recursive step m, we solve all subproblems p i j for which j minus i is equal to m. So at the same time, we solve many different uh, problems at the same time by looking at the solutions of subproblems. So just like uh, in all our previous approaches, we will not just keep track of the solution, we will also keep track of uh, the value of the solution. So the value of the solution uh, is going to be m i minus m i comma j is going to be the minimum number of multiplications to compute the product for the given range i comma j. And we also keep track of this thing which we already have, which is uh, the size of the matrix. So we will denote that size of matrix i is going to be s i minus 1 multiplied by s i. So how do we do the recursion? We examine all possible ways to place the outermost multiplication, splitting the chain into a product from A1 to AK, where is K is some number between I and J, and uh, the other partition is K plus 1 to J. So main thing, main thing to think about is that you're given a range from I to J, and if you want to bracket them, it must be the case that you are putting some matrices on the left, another set of matrices on the right, and within that bracket, we are doing it in some uh, suitable manner. So 
note that k minus i is less than j minus i. So that means that we've already solved uh, this particular problem before we deal with this problem of i comma j. We've already solved for uh, values which are less than j minus i. And j minus k plus 1 is also less than j minus i. Thus, we've already solved these solutions optimally and already stored the solutions uh, in a table as well. So also we note that uh, we know the sizes of the matrices. So the size of matrix uh, product of a i to a k is s i minus 1 times s k. And the size of the product of matrices from a k plus 1 to a j is simply s k times s j. So when you have this case that you have partitioned the matrices into from i to j into two different parts where k is the part which is uh, corresponding to the partitioning. Then you have the case that you know how many total multiplications are required in this case and this is simply equal to s i minus 1 times s j times s k. So what is happening here is that in order to solve a problem for i comma j m i comma j what we do is we go over all possible k's which are between i and j minus 1. For each possible k, we know what the solution of the left side and the right side is and we've already solved that solution because all these problems are subproblems. When we solve the left side and the right side and we want to combine those and multiply those again, then that particular product, additional number of um, real number multiplications, we also know. So by having all this information, basically, we can go over all possible k's, which is linear in the number, uh, in, in the size of this problem input. Uh, for each of those k's, we can find this pos possible value, which gives us the total number of multiplications uh, when we choose a possible k. And since we've already solved subproblems, we can find the optimal solution. So note this recursion step is a brute force search, but the whole algorithm is not brute force because we, we are requiring this contiguity in the problem. So whenever you say i comma j, all you need to do is find a point k in between i comma j. For all those subproblems, you've already solved them optimally. And by doing that, you just find the possible k where you need to partition into brackets and you can do so by using this recursion formula. At any point, you are simply filling up uh, these tables which are not very large, right? So in fact, it's just a table of size um, n squared, right? For m i comma j, and this is all the entries you need to know in order to solve the problem. So, in order to solve the problem, you just need, in fact, big of n squared many subproblems, and you're done. So, note here that k is the minimum in the recursive definition of m i comma j, and it's achieved, and it can be stored to retrieve the optimal placement of bracket for the whole chain of a uh, comma j. So, again, we, what we're doing is very similar to our previous subproblems that. In order to find the solution, we look at subproblems, and we also store the information of which particular subproblem we are using to find our bigger subproblem. So by doing that, we know where to place the brackets, and uh, basically we're done. So any questions regarding this matrix multiplication minimization? OK. So. We still have 10 minutes or 5 minutes, so I'll just define the problem and see how far we go, and then I'll, I'll stop uh, before 2. So the next problem is longest common subsequence, and the problem is that we want to compare how similar two strings are in terms of uh, S and star, and again, as mentioned earlier, they're, they're used in how similar genetic codes are for two viruses. It can also tell us how far two different strings are in terms of mutation. So let's just jump into the actual mathematical problem. You're given a, uh, two, uh, 
possible strings. A sequence, if we say that a sequence s is a subsequence of another sequence s, if small s can be obtained by deleting some of the symbols in big S. So this is the definition of subsequence. And now we are looking at a longest common subsequence of two different strings. So it's simply, if you're given two different strings s and s star, the longest common subsequence of s comma s star is some small s, which is a common subsequence of both s and s star, and it's of maximal possible length. So uh, let's look at a problem. So the problem is finding a maximal uh, longest subsequence. So here in, in this case, we have two different strings. One is of length n, another is of length m. And we want to find the longest common subsequence of s and s star. So in order to solve the problem, first we do not look worry too much about the actual solution. We are actually worrying about the value of the optimal solution. And as often the case uh, in the previous problems, we can just reconstruct the solution by finding the optimal values. So let's just find the length of the longest common subsequence of S and S star. So here we are again going to do something which is called a 2D recursion. And we will go for all i s from 1 to n, where n is the number of entries in string s. We will also go over all j s from 1 to m, where m is the total number of entries in, uh, in string s star. And we will say that c i j is the length of the longest common subsequence of the truncated sequence in which we just restrict our attention to the first i entries of s here and first j entries of s star in this case. Again, uh, if you solve all these problems, can you find the global solution? Or do you know what the value of the global solution is? M, M. Exactly. You, you just put, instead of i, you put the biggest n, and then you put for j, you put m, and you're done. That is going to be the value of your optimal solution, which is global, which in, uh, does not ignore any part of the string. So the recursion is going to be, again, in terms of uh, some table filling. And we always solve the subproblems first, use those solutions of those problems to find the solutions for larger problems. So. The recursion here is going to be uh, quite simple. So c i j is equal to 0 if i is equal to 0, j equal to 0. That makes sense because if one string is of 0 length, of course you can't hope for a subsequence which is of greater than 0. Another is if c i minus 1, comma j minus 1 plus 1. And that is the case if ith entry of a i and b j coincide. In that case, you know that you have found an additional, uh, for i and j, you found an, an entry which coincides for both. In that case, you can simply increase c i minus 1, comma j minus 1 by 1. On the other hand, you may have the case that a i is not equal to b j. In that case, you simply take the maximum of c i minus 1, comma j, and c i, comma j minus 1. So main thing is, again, that you do not have to look at all the entries. You just have to look at three possible entries. So if both of them coincide, you just need to look at the previous i minus 1, j minus 1. If they do not coincide for a, i, and b, j, then you just look at two possible entries, take the maximum of that, and you have found the optimal value when you restrict your attention to i, comma, j. So it's best to look at uh, an example, and it's best to look on the right-hand side at the table, not the actual pseudocode. Because uh, pseudocode is just, may look overawing, but it's actually just building up this table in a very meth methodical manner. So what's happening here is that you have the string corresponding to one. One string is this one. Another string is this one. And we already have a solution here, which is b, c, b, a. B, C, B, A. That is the solution. And of course, if you have zero entries 
of one string, then you have this zero column. If you do not, if uh, this string has zero entries, then you have the zero. And after that, you gradually build up the entries of the table by looking at three possible entries here, this one, this one, and this one. So you always have to look at left, up, or diagonal, and that's it, in order to fill up the next entry. So for example, let's say we are here. So you have A, but you do not include anything which is 0. When you look at the next possible entry, which has increment i by 1 and j by 1, you have B. So this you can increment by 1. And see, it's diagonally, it's one more than the entry, which is diagonal left and uh, up from 1. So every time you have an increment, you see that diagonally there is an entry which is one less than that. And this corresponds to this particular increment here. So you can use this formalism to actually fill up the whole table. All you have to do is for any ij which you want to fill up, you look at a i and b j. If they coincide, then you simply increment it by this value, which is for c i minus 1 and j minus 1. If they do not coincide, you have to look at two other entries, and you're done. So we will continue with this example and this uh, formalism for longest common subsequence, because it's an important one. And uh, this will be tomorrow. So thank you.